Uh, so we'd like to m- welcome to the show a uh, a man who is well known for revolutionizing Wall Street. He's also a well known hockey <laughs> expert, barista. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what else do you do? What else can we put on your resume? Uh, pisses off Doug McLean. I'm a <laughs> legitimate, I think, ten handicap. Oh, in golf, so. there you go, legitimate ten handicap. Yeah. Is that a golf yeah, well, thing? That's, that's the handicap card. Maybe eleven. I can't remember. Okay. We'll have to go Google that later. Definitely a golf thing, Steve. <laughs> I would, I would sign yeah. that scorecard right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Doug Sifu of the Florida Panthers, uh, minority owner, and of course uh, owner uh, uh, of as well as of Virtue Financial. So, Doug, let's let's just start from where this all blew up. How's Shall your we? week been? <laughs> Oh, well, what blew up? What are you guys talking about? Well, you know, there was some things. It's a beautiful day in the stuff. market today. Yeah, how is how are the markets this morning? Uh, pretty good. The Dow's up. Uh, had the Italian referendum last night, so I was up at three in the morning, like talking to some of my guys in Europe. You know, I'm, I'm a busy working guy. Got to pay oh. these hockey bills for South Florida. You know, <laughs> that's right. I feel like an idiot because before we knew you were coming on, like I just tweeted at you, shot in the dark. I was like, what? What? How do you say this guy's name? Sifu, Sifu. I don't know, <laughs> seafood. And I'm making fun of your name. And then I see an interview that you did with a YouTuber named Lucas, and you're right. Italian. <laughs> I'm Italian, yeah, I am Italian. and I didn't yeah, know. Tifu actually is probably the, the correct pronunciation, but it's been Americanized. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Fair enough. Like so, so many yeah. things. So it's been an interesting last week for you. Um, yeah. And, and the team, uh, you know, the, I think what it what it did for everybody was it seemed to suggest one clear pathway. Is that is that correct? Am I correct in saying that? I don't know about that. I mean, look, it was a very, very difficult decision for everybody involved. And, you know, obviously we respect, you know, the opinions of others, the, the hockey pundits out there, the writers and whatnot. But, you know, we decided as a, as a group and obviously Vinny is a managing partner that we were going to move in a different direction. And, you know, we've said all along to our players and to the press and to everybody and the, and the coaches and the front office that it's all about accountability and results at all levels you know we we do everything we possibly can to provide you know that we think the best players and give the players everything necessary that they have to win and everybody's got to be you know rowing in the same direction we have you know we had as as tom said a, a difference in philosophy with gerard and you know gerard's a wonderful man he's a really nice hockey coach and you know had a lot of success with us but you know we're not about this isn't a popularity contest. We get Gerard's a very popular figure up in Canada and other parts, and this is a bit of a polarizing decision, to put it mildly. But, you know, uh, we just got to have everybody on the same page and rowing in the same direction. And, you know, to me, this isn't about analytics or not analytics. I mean, you know, I, I find it amusing, you know, that Tom Rowe, who's 60 years old, you know, an old school hockey guy, pay, played 300 plus games in the NHL. He's got hands as big as meat hooks, and like you know, used to throw, used to throw him in his day. Every time he shakes my hand, I feel like he's gonna crush my hand. The guy's a monster. Uh, you know, he spent spent years in hockey at various different levels. You know, he he's he's not exactly like a computer boy. You know, I don't think Tom could actually turn his uh, PC on without some help. So this isn't, this isn't old school versus new school. It's just you know, we we decided we're gonna all go in one direction, and that a change was needed in order to make that direction successful. And so here we are. Doug, from from where I sit, I think you know part of what you saw the reaction from, and again, this is my opinion, is is it was in some ways an unhockey move. I mean, and hockey is a very conservative, traditionally uh, environment, business wise, and, and and otherwise. And you're sitting here with with three younger people of the media, so we're we're not coming at you um, saying it should continue that way. I mean, is it fair to say that maybe some of what you and Vinny and, and others working for the organization have learned in your business life? Is applying to how you're running a hockey team and how that might. Yeah, uh, I mean, look, we you know. we get it. You know, the game is larger than everybody, and it's been around, you know, for a long, long time. And we have great respect for the traditions of hockey. And you know, I've said this publicly before. I mean, it. it I'm awestruck by the tenacity and the strength and the and the gladiator-like spirit of these players. I mean, now that I have the blessing of actually having getting down near the ice and occasionally getting to go into the locker room and see them, you know, after practices and games, I mean, I'm just awestruck by the, you know, uh, the, what it takes to be a professional hockey player. So that we have tremendous, tremendous respect for everybody in the game. But, you know, when we bought this franchise in 2013, it was not doing particularly well on, on or off the ice. And we said, listen, we, we, are very good at operating businesses. That's what we do. We started this firm, Virtue Financial. Vinny and I are partners on other things together. 
You know, Vinny has had a long history on Wall Street. I was pretty successful uh, lawyer here in New York and said, we said, we're going to apply like our operating discipline and, and, and accountability to, to a professional sports franchise. So, you know, ironically, we didn't come in there and just blow the place up, right? We came in there and said, all right, we're going to take a look at everybody and everything from frankly, you know, the GM on down to, you know, the secretary in the office and say, you know, what are people doing? Let's measure their, their success or lack of success and then be honest and forthright with people. And sure, have we replaced a lot of people? Absolutely. But it wasn't a rash decision. We didn't just go to West Point and bring a bunch of <laughs> army guys in. I mean, it's kind of silly and borderline offensive to suggest that. I and mean, we were very careful and thoughtful about it. And parenthetically, you know, we've dropped about $100 million <laughs> in the last three years for that pleasure. So, you know, we were thoughtful and mechanical about it. Obviously, this coaching situation is kind of – created this whole firestorm of analytics versus non-analytics, which I think is a little a little kind of obfuscates kind of what we've tried to do over the last three years, but it is what it is. Uh, I called it the Battle of Sunrise in a, in a video that I did because, I mean, whether you like it or not, you are kind of, um, I guess, the latest front uh, in the analytics versus non-analytics yep. debate. But mm-hmm. getting away from whether that's even accurate or true or not, are you kind of reveling in this – almost uh, us against the world sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, look, reveling's the wrong word, right? Like, I don't, I don't relish, uh, you know, my wife gets upset when people, like, pound me on Twitter and social media. I, I mean, I kind of chuckle about it. I, I mean, know, she's she a little upset me. about some of this stuff. <laughs> and, you know, she's a tough woman. I mean, like, it's not a lot of fun to have, you know, ex-hockey coaches or whatever they are and, you know, other commentators who used to talk about hot dog carts or whatever that guy did up in Toronto, like you know, all of a sudden calling us computer boys and army guys. I mean, it's just, it's superficial nonsense. And, and, and I get that. And I just, I, I ignore all that stuff. Other than the fact, that actually, I did look for uh, that suit that, uh, that Don Cherry was wearing in a 48 Husky and I could not find it. So if, if anybody, <laughs> we, we if have anybody a tailor finds, up here. We know where Don's tailor okay. is. We can hook you up. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking, I thought, I thought it'd be really funny if I went on Twitter and tell me what you guys think. We can do a Twitter poll. Maybe you guys can help me sure, out. Sure. A Twitter poll. If I started like a GoFundMe campaign to buy one of me those suits in, in 48 Husky, what do you think? <laughs> I, I think we could do that. Yeah. yeah a little totally. too cheeky? Is it a little too cheeky? Not at all. No, my goodness. Okay. Is it a little too yeah, cheeky? I don't want to be too snarky. I mean, but anyhow. You don't want to, to be it. too so snarky, like, Doug? <laughs> the, the guy whose Twitter picture is a t-shirt that says hockey expert? You don't want no. to be too snarky, Doug? <laughs> yeah. That was that was snarky. That was a little too snarky. But I thought that was kind of funny. Actually. It is. I mean, it, it sort oh, of goes to the point, which is... <laughs> Look, we're not trying to revolutionize a sport. All we're saying is, I'll give you a perfect example, right? So, like, in 2007, Vinny comes to me and says, you know, uh, I was a, a practicing lawyer. I was his lawyer, his friend. And he says, we're going to start this firm called Virtu Financial. We're going to be the largest electronic market maker in the world. I'll be honest with you, and I've said this privately and publicly, I didn't know a bid from an offer. I didn't know anything about the about market structure. I didn't know really anything about the financial markets at all. I mean, I was a corporate lawyer, but it was not what I did. And I said, Vinny, you sure? He said, yeah, you're a smart guy. You'll figure it out. And so I figured it out. And then nine years later, I'm the CEO of a multi-billion dollar public company. That's the largest electronic market making firm in the world. Now, my partner is brilliant and, and unbelievably tactically involved and whatnot and experience and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, it's just something that you have to put your mind to and learn. That's what technology is all about. That's what I did here. I'm not a technologist. I'm not a computer boy, but I'm not afraid of it. So I think what, we, what you're really seeing here is, uh, you know, people saying, and I'm saying, and others are saying, listen, we get it. It's hockey. We never played it. Like, you know, but at the end of the day, there are certain things that you can look at that are objective. Yep. And you can make an objective determination as to whether you think someone is a better fit for your team than not a better fit, that someone should get paid X and someone should get paid Y, all those kind of things. So rather than just have like a feel or throw spaghetti against the wall, we're trying to be a little more thoughtful about how we construct a team. Now, are we perfect? No. Have we made mistakes? Absolutely. Um, is this 100% about analytics, you know, versus non-analytics? No. As I say to people, like, you know, Dale's very involved with everything we do. Uh, you know, uh, we got Pete Mahovlich, uh, who uh, we talk to regularly. You know, Tom Rowe isn't exactly like a computer boy. You know, uh, Eric Joyce, everyone calls him a computer boy. Sure, he went to Harvard. He's a very smart guy, but the kid played hockey at West Point. I think he had you know, he got thrown out of a couple of games for fighting. I mean, he's not exactly like a, you know, a pencil neck geek. So I think this is a little bit 
people being afraid, if you will, or concerned that, uh, you know, that there's, there may be a different way to do things, or maybe other people with different points of view can, can help construct a professional sports organization in a way that's very progressive. It's not trying to disrespect the game. It's not saying we're going to do everything completely differently, but like, let's at least open our eyes and be thoughtful about it. That's all we're doing. Doug, there are many people in your shoes that, that have public facing Twitter accounts, I'm wondering, you know, yeah. why you operate one, and if you could share any funny stories or anything that's come of it. What, oh, you, what gosh, you like I could about share you it? A lot of stories. I mean, he, the honest answer is I had no clue about social media. Right? I never did it. wasn't really involved. I didn't have a Facebook account. That kind of thing. And you know, Vinny and I kind of talked about it. And I'm a people person. And this whole, I think this whole mystique around ownership is completely overdone. At the end of the day, Vinny and I are both blue collar Italian guys. From I'm from Long Island. He's from Brooklyn. And we've been blessed beyond belief, you know, with our business success. We worked really hard for it, but we've been blessed. And so we're living this adolescent fantasy of having the ability to help influence a professional sports franchise. So the notion that, like, somehow I interact with people, like, all right, so what? I mean, at the end of the day, like, it's just a, it's just a moniker, right? This mm-hmm. notion of being an owner. I'm a regular guy, and I was the guy – in 1988, that scraped together $14 a game to go sit in the blue seats at Madison Square Garden and watch the Rangers play. Like, I know how hard it is to make money and have to pay. I was in law school at the time. I didn't have any extra money. So I completely respect the idea that, that people are working hard and giving us their very, very valuable discretionary entertainment dollars. So why shouldn't I give them the respect of responding to them? So, like, just today some young lady that I met down in South Florida, I think she's like 17 or 18. Like she tweets, it's her dream to meet Dennis Malgin, who's one of our young players. So sure. I invite her to a, uh, a morning skate, I think next week. And Dennis will take five or 10 minutes and say hello to her. Right. Like what's the big deal. That's what we should do. That's kind of part of our responsibility of being a steward of like a great professional sports franchise. The one thing that I've been completely blown away by completely blown away. And you saw it this last week is just the power of sport. Right, it brings communities together, and it makes people, you know, uh, next to politics and religion. I've never seen emotional reactions like this. I had people in towns in Canada I've never heard of, you know, trolling me and harassing me about <laughs> about fire, firing a coach in, in South Florida that they'd never met before. <laughs> right, like, God, I I get it. God bless them. But I was like, I said to my wife, I said, you know, like. It's amazing that people will take the time to come and abuse me about something that they know absolutely nothing about, and they probably feel this cathartic sense of relief. So if that helps, that's cool. And that's one of the reasons I want to do it. I want to be the, you know, the punching bag and also, you know, get the pat on the back. Well, Doug, welcome to the Internet. Uh, yeah. yeah <laughs> exactly. That's what it's all about. Exactly. I, I want to ask you, because I know, I know what you guys started in 2008 with Virtue. Yeah, uh, there's yep. there's some similarities to what is going on in, with the Panthers that happened in 2008. I mean, you guys started that company in probably the worst financial year since the 1930s. Uh, yeah, and you know, and it's Brilliant amazing, guys, aren't we? Yeah, yeah that's right. Bro- the world's burning up. Let's start a financial firm. Yeah, your, your timing was phenomenal. Um, <laughs> Thank but you. Your the, the the question that I have is, you know, at that point, Wall Street was a was a very conservative. Things are done, not conservative, but things are done this way. This is the way we do things. This is how we make money. And you came in, you upset that apple cart. When you look at the NHL and there is this conservative, this is our way, this is how it's done, you don't know any better. Is there a little bit of that kind of fire in you, that renegade that kind of goes, yeah, you know what? I don't believe that. And I, I think we can do we can do it our way. Oh, boy, is that a softball. Okay, i got to be a little careful here, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, the answer is absolutely yes. I mean, we, Vinny and I are not, we're not zealots, right? We didn't come into this to, like, put Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan out of business. Quite the contrary. What we are is a, an efficiency creator. All we've done is take technology and automation and apply it to a very important financial intermediation function. I know that sounds really fancy, but you've got a buyer and seller of something. Mm-hmm. You need somebody that's in the middle to manage that risk between a buyer and seller. That's called a market maker, okay? And so 30 years ago, you had trading rings in Toronto and in Calgary and in Kansas City and Chicago and New York and Amsterdam where human beings did that, okay? Vinny's genius, and with other folks, he realized, you know, 20 years ago that you could have a computer take those same if-then inputs and reduce that that human function into an automated function that a computer could do, frankly, better, faster, and with more resiliency. Right. Right. And that's all we did at Virtu, right? So we took 
the spread, in other words, the price that between a buyer and what a seller has to pay and what the transaction costs are, we help collapse that, right? So today, if you're a, a widow sitting in Omaha, you want to buy 100 shares of GE, or you're sitting up in Saskatoon and you want to buy 100 shares of Rogers or something like that, your transaction cost to do that is literally like, you know, almost a hundredth of what it used to be. Mm-hmm. And the spread that you have to pay is literally a penny of, and it used to be a quarter at least. Okay. So we've helped create that efficiency. That's all Virtu did. Now that was a threat. You're right. There were hundreds of men and women that were in those trading rings that, that were supported by that. And unfortunately, a lot of them ended up losing their jobs and it was a new way of looking at things. But we work in collaboration with the banks and we're very constructive in how we work with them and they've adopted some of our technology. We trade now with JP Morgan and others and whatnot. And I'm wasting your time talking about financial markets, but I find it interesting. <laughs> so three, four years ago, three, four years ago, there was this whole uproar about high frequency trading and Michael yeah. Lewis came out with this book called Flash Boys. And if you Google Flash Boys and Virtu and Doug Sifu, you'll see, you know, they wanted me to go on TV. They wanted, they were saying I was a criminal. We were going to go to jail. We were cheating, blah, blah, blah. To me, it was all the same reaction, a similar reaction reaction to people saying, listen, you guys are doing something different. It's got to be wrong. You can't always be successful. You can't always be making money. You got to be doing something wrong. So is there an analogy? Absolutely. Am I suggesting that every old school hockey person is going to be gone? No, but, but you got to adapt, man. There's got to be guys like Tom Rowe that I'm telling you cannot turn on their computer. The guy's 60 years old. He's been in hockey for 45 years. He started playing in Lynn Mass when he was 12 years old, made the NHL. And you know what? He embraces it. He says, look, it's a good way to look at players. I've had a great conversations with Tom about it. Even Dale Talon, I tell you what, Dale's not, a, not an old school guy. You know, he, you know, he's not going to sit there and rattle off Corsi and Fenwick. By the way, I don't even know what those things mean. Put that aside. <laughs> but, but, but Dale's a guy that will listen. Pete Mahovlich, he loves his analytic stuff. Mm-hmm. Loves it. Talks to Steve Worry about it all the time. So there are people that are willing to listen and adapt and get better. Is it the be all end all? Absolutely not. Do we have a bunch of like MIT nerds running our running our team? Absolutely not. Uh, you know, I wouldn't call Tom and, and Dale and, and Pete nerds. I mean, you know, we re signed Sean Thornton and the analytics guys crushed us. Like why would you do that? We <laughs> trade <laughs> Dylan Dylan McElrath and everyone's like, you know, we've got two of the toughest guys in the NHL on our team. So look, we're not we're not you know, but I really do think your question is a fantastic one. I think there's a a, a real you know, almost backlash against, hey, maybe there's a different way to do this. I just don't understand why, you know, really smart people that didn't have the the blessing of having to be able to put on skates and, and play hockey really well can't at least add some value to putting together a hockey team. Well, I, I, that's why I'm uh, putting in a bid to become a GM in the NHL one day. Uh, I think it's possible. Uh, and Anything is possible. I like to live my dreams. Um, so uh, I'm sure a lot of people have asked you this on Twitter already, but Let's get yep. audio of it. Do you have a hockey background at all pre Florida Panthers? No. Zero. Just a fan. Amazing. Zero. Just no, a fan. I'm, yeah, and I'm proud of that. And it doesn't mean, look, I'm, I, I, obviously I kind of had some fun at, at uh, Doug McLean's expense on the hockey expert thing because I just thought it was, you know, kind of, you know, odd. Let's put it that way that he was targeting me. But putting that aside. Look, I get it. You know, he's friends with Gerard and I would react the same way. And I totally respect his, his point of view. If, if one of my friends had a situation, might I lash out like that? I would. And I said, you know what? Like I, I, people have always said, I've got a good sense of humor. So I decided to have a little bit of fun with it. And I did tweet him back and I thought it was kind of amusing, but, uh, uh, I'm not going to do any more of that. But at the end of the day, Look, I don't consider myself a hockey expert. I don't even know what that means. I mean, we surround ourselves with guys that have a lot of experience, right? The Dales, the Peets, the Toms. We surround ourselves with people that haven't played the game, but like are pretty good at doing some analytical work. And, and those are all inputs, right? But, you know, the eye test is important, mm-hmm. right? The same as the... Uh, you know, same as the computer test. And I the thought hot dog some of the test, work right? that, <laughs> Yeah, and the hot dog test. I thought some of the work that the guys in Vancouver did, you know, the Vancouver Army, whatever you call it. Canucks Army. Canucks drafting. Army. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you hired half of them. You should know their name. Better than the Vancouver Canucks. I mean, I read that article. I thought it was kind of fascinating, actually, and I think there's a lot of value in that. I mean, you know, you look at, the, to be blunt, look at the Florida Panthers draft history the last you know, five, six, seven, eight years. You know, it, it has not been spectacular. Yeah, so, Zach you know, Hyman was a great reasons, pick. One of the things we're trying to fix. Right, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, so you, you've referenced uh, Dale Talon uh, a number of times in this interview, and and uh, and I've seen previous interviews where you know Dale Talon, Dale Talon, the guidance of Dale Talon. 
Well, one thing that ruffled feathers long before the Gerard Gallant firing was everyone seemed to think the promotion of Dale Talon right. was kind of a false promotion. Mm -hmm. He was promoted in title, but in fact, his powers had been taken away. What is his role with the team beyond his title? Yeah, I think what, what, con what concerns people or confuses people, to put it bluntly, is that you know, we have a different structure, right? Like, you know, at Virtu, titles are meaningless. I don't have an organizational chart here, mm -hmm. right? I'm the CEO, and there's a big, and Vinny's on top of me, right? Because he's the majority owner. And then there's a big box that says people that work at Virtu, right? So it's a little chaotic. And obviously, I've got people that have been more senior here than, than not, but I've got 152 ish employees, and every one of them, I interact with and every one of them kind of, you know, reports to me, yeah, we have some other people, but I don't have a head of this and a head of that. So we're not big title guys. And so, mm -hmm. you know, in looking at the structure of an NHL club, does it make sense to have a single person that is really good at scouting, is really good at negotiating contracts, is really good at going to that rink in Saskatoon and finding that kid that no one else has found, and is really good at counting sticks and pucks and managing a budget? Right. There may be a human being that can do for all four of those, and I'm sure there are examples you could give me in the NHL. But you know what? That's, those are four kind of very diverse skill sets. Right. And so what we decided to do was take each of those skill sets and put people in charge of them that we thought were really good at each of those four skill sets. So, you know, I think Dale is, I said this a thousand times, he's a hockey whisperer. The guy is great at identifying hockey talent, particularly young talent. Uh, I talk to him as much as I talk to, and Vinny does as well, as much as I talk to Tom Rowe, as much as I talk to Eric Joyce and Steve Worry, actually probably more, because I find Dale a lot more entertaining and amusing than Worry and Joyce. He's actually a really funny, funny guy. Yeah. So, you know, we get a lot of good input from him. So is he doing the same thing he was doing before we bought the team or the first two years? No, he's not, right? But I think in some ways we're getting the best out of him, because rather than me being up as you know what about like you know a budget or you know did we have 18 extra sticks and we only needed 15 i'm, I'm kidding you know he, yeah. he doesn't have to worry about that stuff anymore so have him do what he's good at and the same token you know steve's steve's a good steve's a former lawyer as well or is a currently a lawyer excuse me so he's good at negotiating contracts you know i think dale's probably relieved he doesn't have to deal with that and steve was very busy in the off season negotiating contracts and i think frankly he did a pretty pretty nice job so I think we've kind of come up with a new paradigm here a little bit, and that, that confuses people. And so we get into words as to promotion and titles and all this kind of stuff. You know, you can ask Dale yourself. Um, you know, at some level, I'm sure he was disappointed that a lot of his you know, duties were changed. But on the other hand, I think he, you know, uh, he's pretty happy you know, uh, uh, with his role in the team. He's got a lot of direct access to Vinny and myself. And you know, he's a really important part of what we're trying to do here. Uh, Elliot Friedman interviewed uh, Tom Rowe. Um, and it was, I, I think it was kind of like the, the first big interview, uh, anyone yep. in the organization had really done since, since the firing. And one thing that seemed crystal clear to me by the end of it was this was a ownership decision, um, to go in a different direction, uh, with Gerard Gallant. Would you agree with that? Well, here's what I would say. I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, ultimately, you know, Vinny's the controlling, you know, owner and all that kind of stuff is, is, you know, Doug has said a number of times, I'm just a minority owner. Uh, <laughs> and so at the end of the day, yeah, sure. It was just, it was just team, a everything. minority owner, Doug. Just, just, I know. Just a pilot. <laughs> as, as my mother-in-law would say, what a Shonda that is. What a Shonda. Uh, <laughs> uh, but look, at the end of the day, everybody was supportive of it, right? It wasn't like Tom was beating his chest against the wall. I mean, I wasn't there, frankly. I was on a plane to Dublin. So Vinny and Tom had this conversation and then Vinny, Tom and Gerard had the conversation. But, you know, look, Tom's being an honest guy, and we're not, we're not trying to hide behind our, our, our GM. And I know Vinny spoke to Dale about it, and it's not like we, it was just some rash, you know, decision that was made. I, I completely regret the circumstances, you know, the, 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 the photo with the taxi and all that kind of stuff, which was, you know, unbelievably distorted and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it was, it's not, not who we are, and it's not how we want to reflect our relationship with Gerard. I mean, for heaven's sake, we had just extended the guy in January, and we thought the world of him, and we were very optimistic that he would be the right person to, to lead this team to a Stanley Cup, when ultimately we concluded that that was not the case. You know, we took action. You know, should we have done it in Chicago or after the road trip or here or there or everywhere? Sure, that's, you know, hockey fans and commentators will second guess and and be critical of that, and I completely respect their right to do that, and, you know, in some instances, they're right. I mean, 
it would have been a lot I would have felt a lot better if we hadn't had those pictures come out and whatnot. But at the end of the day, this was a very, very difficult decision for everybody involved. It, I think it reflected, you know, the collaborative and collective view of everybody in the organization uh, that was talked to about it. And so we took action. Uh, so, okay, we've already decided that we don't know what hockey person means. Uh, hockey I, expert. Hockey right. expert. I, I don't think I'll ever know. But we have identified Tom Rowe as a hockey guy. Um, I think, yeah, 45 years in hockey and, and hands like meat hooks means that, uh, <laughs> yeah, totally. I get it. Yeah. And he is yeah. now your you GM. The guy's hand, by the way, he's got, he'll, he'll crush you. So be no, careful. But I look forward to it. Oh, I, <laughs> I hope one yeah. day. I look forward to getting crushed. So he's a hockey guy. Uh, he's right. currently your team's GM. He's your team's coach. Um, right. He's, he's got the keys right now, but this is a guy who in that interview with Friedman identified the first period of that game against Carolina as the best first period that team had had all season. So right. for me, it's hard to look. I know you say it's not a rash decision, but with everything I read and everything I see, it gets harder and harder for me to not see it that way. Yeah. Well, I think he also said, you know, the second period was one of the most disappointing you know, periods of the season and whatnot. So I think that's the mm-hmm. kind of a little bit the yin and the yang of what the Panthers have been this year. I mean, at times we look like that 103-point, you know, division-winning team. At other points, we, we candidly don't. So I think it was really just the inconsistency. I mean, in a way, that was almost like a microcosm of the season of the first 22 games. Uh, and, it, you know, it was sort of was the, the, the triggering point for us to, to move forward. I mean, I think, you know, Tom put it very well he said look there's just a difference he said the following day there's just a difference in philosophy here and and we were hopeful that everyone would sort of get behind what we were trying to do here and accomplish and at the end of the day you know uh we all felt collectively that that was not the case and so we made a decision i mean i i get it people will second guess it you know we should have flown to chicago you know all that kind of stuff i just think in a way you know Vinny and i are used to when when we need to make a change or decide that we want to do something, you know, it, it's always been our history just to take action because, right. you know, there may be repercussions in the moment and whatnot, but at the end of the day, the organization needs a clear vision and needs to move forward. And that's kind of what we decided to do. Or, Did you learn from this? Do you think? Because I think the obvious solution to me, like this does not blow up uh, nearly as big as it does without that picture. Yeah. Without Gerard yeah. Gallant outside the arena in Carolina. Do you was that a learning experience? Absolutely. Look, I mean I I said uh 5 minutes ago and I've said to people privately, you know, it was not the way that we wanted this to go down obviously. It showed uh it 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 showed us, you know, look like we were a, a dysfunctional organization when quite the opposite is the case. We're very unified and we collaborate and we talk a whole heck of a lot and there's no politics and you know, we we try to be very collaborative in our decision making and whatnot, but it, it was you know it was not how we wanted to be reflected. Uh, I was felt awful that it that it embarrassed Gerard. He's a unbelievably talented and very very decent man. Uh, you know, he's never been anything but very cordial and friendly to me, and more importantly to my 13 year old son who was so mad at me the next day because he loves Gerard. And uh, so, look, I mean, it was it was frankly an embarrassment. And, uh, you know, I, I w- we have apologized to Gerard and he because he's such a mensch on his own, you know, contacted Friedman and, and said, you know, the whole taxi thing didn't go down that way. It was 100 percent his decision. But had I been there, would I have managed it differently? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm more experienced with dealing with you know, crises, I guess, than other folks are. You know, Tom was busy running around, and our team services guy, you know, did his best to try to make the situation not be as awkward as it was. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it looked it looked terrible. Uh, it didn't reflect well on the Florida Panthers, and for that, we apologize. I, I, I want to just move off that just for a second, Doug, and I, I want to ask you, okay, so it's, it's 2012, 2013. The Florida Panthers are not pulling in more than, what, five 6,000 a night, in seats and here yep. you guys come with with you know again timing you start this company in 2008 where it's you know the, the one of the worst tough toughest economies in you know 70 years and then you take the team that literally loses the most money and you go yeah i want that one where 
where where were you guys like? Yes, this is a great opportunity. How did you how did you come to that decision? That's like, why are you so stupid and arrogant? Is that the, uh, is <laughs> not that, at all, I, not I, at all. But it's like, it's can like, I, can that, I rephrase the question? Move to strike. It's a challenge. <laughs> it's, it's it seems like you guys. Like yeah. <laughs> I mean, look. At the end of the day, there's only 122 of these things, right? The professional sports franchise and the four. In the four major leagues, right? Vinny and I made his decision sitting at a Ranger game one day years and years ago. Hey, wouldn't it be great if, uh, you know, we, we work really well together. We think we know what we're doing. We've been successful here. You know, we're very, very humble about the, the success that we've been given, and we thought we could apply that to a, to a sports franchise. I, I happen to have had a house in South Florida for a long time because I cannot stand the winters here and you haven't met me, but I do not look good in a bathing suit. So buying a, uh, buying a beach house would not have been a great idea for me. Uh, and my boy at the time used to be a devil's fan. I was a Ranger fan. And so we used to go down to sunrise a bunch and watch the Panthers play those team and watch the Panthers play other teams. And we loved it. And I said to Vinny one day, I said, you know, Vin, there's this team called the Florida Panthers. They got this beautiful arena. It's a little bit far west, but it's in Broward County. It's really gorgeous. It's a good vibe there. It's a real family atmosphere. I said, you know, the next, you know, why don't you give Bettman a call? And, you know, that might be something that, that would be cool for us. And he did. He met met the commissioner. And, and it just so happened within, I don't know, a month or two or three, the, the Panthers were, you know, the, the prior owner wanted to get out. And so we because of a combination of arrogance, stupidity, and uh, excitement, decided to go take the leap. I mean, we knew we knew we had a lot, a it, lot. Uh, there's a lot. A lot it's of, a challenge. Uh, it was a lot to do. It was really, you know, to be blunt with you, it was a lot worse than I even expected. Wow. It was a lot worse. I mean, it was, you know, we, we had a promotion. I, you know, this has been abused about in, in the media, so it was not us, but where we had a deal with the Florida lottery that if you had a losing lottery ticket, you'd get a Panther t- seat. So Ooh. someone like tweeted out, well, that's garbage, isn't it? So you're giving away seats for garbage. And you know what? They were right. They were right. So that's what we were dealing with. We had the $4 stub up seats. So look, we've worked really hard. We completely turned the franchise around. We think we've done some good things on the ice in collaboration with our, with our hockey experts. And we've pumped an ungodly amount of money, you know, into the franchise to try to stabilize it. We reached a great deal with Broward County. I mean, I spent the first two years of my, of my uh, tenure here with Vinny, you know, trying to understand French because people from various Quebec newspapers wanted to interview me and explain to me when I was moving the team to Quebec. I mean, so <laughs> we, were really, we when, were really up against it for the first couple of years, my friends. When are you moving it to Quebec? <laughs> uh, at this juncture, as soon as I get my uh, as soon as I get my suit and forty eight Husky, I'm out of here. There no, you I'm go. <laughs> no. uh, we're I, never I, moving. We're never moving. I, I think to help along Adam's very gently put question from uh, a couple minutes ago is why did you become part owner of the Panthers? Because it certainly wasn't for the money. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that. You know what? I, I don't know what to tell you other than uh, we thought we could do something special with regard to a sports franchise and really turn it around. And frankly, and and I, this I say this really sincerely from the bottom of my heart. This is not about ego. This is not about me and Vinny jumping on the ice and holding up a Stanley Cup. You'll never see that happen. You'll see a bunch of players and our coaches and our GMs with a Stanley Cup. This is all about the players. They're the guys that play. They're the guys that win. We have very, very little to do with it. And more importantly, it's all about the community. There is something really, really powerful about sport. When I got there in October of 2013, and I sit in the stands because I like to sit in the stands. I can't stand these stuffer, stuffy owner seats uh, <laughs> or boxes, whatever you call them. I just find them so annoying. I like to be down low and watch the game. You know, I saw like five, six, seven thousand 7,000 rabid Florida Panther fans. And I actually talked to some of them, and I said, why in the world would you be a Florida Panther season ticket holder? You can buy a seat for five dollars and stuff up. You don't. You haven't been to the playoffs in, I don't know, once in the last twelve years or whatever it was at the time. Why on earth would you? And they kind of looked at me quizzically, and they were like, you know, because we love the Florida Panthers. That is such a powerful dynamic. It, it's amazing how sport brings together a community. And right. if we could actually get our act together, I mean, we saw it a little bit in the playoffs last year. So there's nobody that wants to win more than Vinny and myself. This is 100% geared towards excellence and creating accountability in the organization and, and, and building a winning organization. Are people going to agree with what we do? No. Are people going to get pissed off about trades and this and that? Absolutely. But everybody should know 
that our hearts and our heads are 100% dedicated to that singular purpose, which is to win a championship. I said last year when we made the playoffs and lost that the season was a failure, and people kind of looked at me funny, uh, and I said, yeah, we didn't win, right? I mean, we right. don't come in second at Virtu every day. We, we, we come in first or we work harder. So that's what we're trying to do. Uh, I, my, I guess my question originally was going to be, and I, I didn't want to be disrespectful, but I, wa- I was going to say, what the hell were you thinking? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but, I, I mean, don't know. It's, my wife asks me that all the time, and then I get abused for being a minority partner who's just sending millions of dollars down to South Florida. So, you know, what so, kind of schmuck am I? So we we had a podcast. I should have just bought a suite at Madison Square Garden. It would have been cheaper. It would have been. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we had a podcast uh, months ago where we ranted and raved about uh, the Edmonton Oilers because a story had come out uh, that before the 2012 draft, uh, they had a vote, but uh, I think it was between nine people on who to vote f- uh, on who to draft first overall. Seven people selected uh, Ryan Murray. Two selected Nail Yakupov, and one of those two people was Daryl Cates, their owner. Therefore, the team picked Yakupov, and time seems to have proved that decision wrong. Even though I liked Yak at the time, yeah. and probably would have picked him first. Yeah. But. Um, I, I yelled and screamed about that because I didn't think owners should be involved in hockey decisions at all. And then I was speaking right. to someone about it, and they're like, well, they pay the bills. Yeah. So, yeah. and it's hard to deny that. Where, where do you where do you sit there? How involved do you think you and others should be? I mean, I, I think, look, I, mean, I think you need to— know what's going on and, and obviously manage the budget and whatnot and, and challenge your people, right? So, like, I went to the draft this year because I just think it's cool to sit at the draft and walk around and there's, you know, Bobby Clark and Patrick Watt. Like, I'm a fan at the end of the day, too. Like, it's I pinch really myself cool. sometimes when Yager says hello to me, right? Yeah. It's still pretty cool, right? Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And one out of every five times he actually knows my name, so it's even better, right? So, Does he still say hello so, after Golan got fired? Or? Yeah. <laughs> I went to the draft because Keith Yandel was going to be there. I wanted to meet Dave Barr. You know, I had interviewed him one time, but he was going to be there. So I thought it was like a good thing. So I'm on the draft floor, Vinny and I, and we're talking to Dale, and we're talking about our number one pick. And it just so happens, you know, the analytics guys like this kid Borkstrom a lot. And Dale had gone to watch him skate in Chicago or some other place where there was some showcase or something like that. And Vinny and I both went up to Dale at the same time and said, what do you think of this kid Borkstrom? He says, you know, something like, Kid skates like the wind. You know, one of these great, he's got great hands. You know, one of these Dale Talonisms that, like, mm-hmm. I can't nearly do as well. And Vinny looked at him, and I obviously shook my head yes and said, Dale, if that's who you want to pick, that's, you know, you got my support 100%. And so he became the consensus pick of the room. As we were hoping he would still be available, and, and he was. I forgot what we picked, 22 or 24, whatever it was. And so we picked Borkstrom. So that's that's how it works. We're not there in the room. These guys spend weeks and weeks together, our amateur scouts, uh, you know, some of the computer boys we brought along and we <laughs> kind of force that, we force that friction, right? Like we've got a bunch of great guys now that respect each other enough that they can get in a room for a week or two weeks over months and months and months, and they can come out with a consensus view that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Right? Like I, I you know, it just that's just kind of how it works. I mean, I've heard some crazy things before. People are saying, "Oh, you should draft for this and that and all that kind of stuff." At the end of the day, let the let all those people get together and then say, "Hey, here's who we want to draft." And I mean, what do I know? I've never seen Henrik Borkstrom play. Right? I don't even know what Finnish league he was in. So at the end of the day, he seemed like great, and the kid's playing great at Denver. He's, I think he's leading leading the country of scoring, one of the best scorers in the country. And the kid we took in the second round. Uh, Marsharin or whatever his name is, you know, he's got a great shot, and I know the guys liked him. So, you know, looks like we did a pretty good job this year. Um, you know, this is this is a true softball question, so get ready. Uh, I love it, baby. This, this is going to be the, the softest ball question you're, you're going to get. Um, I, I wanted to know, as a fan who has looked at teams and gone, I would love to own a team one day, what right. has been, in the last three years, the most fun experience? What's been the story that you're like, wow. I can't believe that happened, and I can't believe I'm here. Ah, uh, wow! Well, it's a layup. I had breakfast with Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> yeah. oh, actually, no, I got a better one than I got a better one. That was that was pretty cool. Okay, and I was like, for once, I was kind of awestruck. And he's a wonderful man, by the way. Wow, what a, what an honor it was. But even better than that. So uh, 
I go to the arena one day last season and I had to go do something like, I don't know, meet a sponsor, whatever it was. I, my son is 12 at the time. And you know, we're my best friend in the world. He always tags along. So I have to drop him someplace to babysit. And you know, one of the best things I have, obviously is I can go anywhere I want. So I go into the, the skate sharpening stick room. Cause I know the guys will come in beforehand and Danny will sit on the couch and they love, they're all nice to Danny. Like Willie Mitchell was always great to him. He likes Eckblatt. Brian Campbell was his favorite player and they'll all talk to him. He'll just sit there. No problem. And hopefully he won't put his hand into the stick sharpening machine, right? Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, his mother would kill me if that happened. So I, I go half hour, I come back, okay, and um, I look on the couch, and he's sitting with an older gentleman, and they're watching the World Junior Championship. So I don't know what time of year that was on TV. And they're sitting there talking about it. And I look at it, and I say to myself, I don't believe it. You know who it is? It's Bobby Orr. So there's my son sitting on a couch in a locker room, with a bunch of professional hockey players, and he's hanging out with Bobby Orr, and he's calling him Bobby. And I'm like, Mr. Orr, it's an honor to, you know, I know Bobby a little bit. Good to see you again. I'm Doug Seif. He goes, I know who you are. He goes, you know, your son actually, like, knows his hockey. I'm like, <laughs> maybe he's the hockey expert. <laughs> so you know what? You know, I grew up, I went to one giant football game a year, and we sat in section 332, four rows from the top, and we brought our own food, you know? So, like, yeah. the fact that I have the blessing that I can give this to my son is, you know, it, it makes me it makes me very emotional because that's really what this is all about for us. It's about, you know, having our family do something really fun and, as I said, try to share it with other people. So this young lady that's going to get to meet Dennis Malgan, that makes me feel great. This past week I had a, a kid you know, uh, tweet me that he loved Nick Bukestead. I happen to know who the kid is. And so I made him go, I had, he lives up in Ottawa, the young man. So I had him come to the morning skate and he got to watch his hero skate around. And Nick was a, Nick's a great guy. Nick signed a puck for him. So that, you know, that's, those are the, the, the fun things that we can do, um, that really make this all worthwhile. It seems like a good time. It really, really does. Like, yeah. I mean, it, you know, yeah. a, lot, a lot of pressure, uh, and sometimes the, you know, things blow up like they did last week, but, uh, it's just an incredible, it's an incredible game and it's an incredible thing to be around. Yeah, it really is. Look, it, I, I'm so privileged and honored and Vinny would say the same thing and humbled to be part of this magnificent game. I mean, I, you know, it's largely a Canadian game. I get that. I have tremendous respect for even the guys that were abusing me this week. You know, we have a lot of respect for them uh, and what they've meant to the game over the years. And I really do sincerely mean that. And at the end of the day, we try really, really hard, you know, to do the right thing all the time. But you know what? We're going to we're gonna do what we think is right. You know, we may not win every popularity contest. We're not going to win the, the Stanley Cup every year. But we're going to try really hard. We've been really transparent about our tickets, ticketing policy down in South Florida. You know, we spent a boatload of money this year. One of the criticisms of the Panthers was, you know, guys would come, play their entry-level deal, and leave after three or seven years, whatever it was. And so we locked up, you know, our core. Mm -hmm. You guys, you know, all the names for a long time. So we're trying to do all the right things. Are we always going to be successful? No. Will we hold everybody accountable? Absolutely. You know, from top to bottom. Are we going to make this into a meritocracy? Absolutely. Uh, are people still going to be critical? Sure, that's their right. That's what that's what makes sport great. That's one of the reasons I kind of enjoy Twitter. Um, you know, even when people are kind of a little nasty. <laughs> um, so I know you said it's not a popularity contest, but obviously the Panthers, you know, took a bit of a hit uh, this week yep. in, in terms of popularity. How does how does that recover? You think it's as simple as winning? Yeah, it's just winning. It's just winning. I mean, this is, you know, like I we talked before about Virtu and Flash Boys and all that kind yeah. of stuff. And like, you know, I, I tell people this. In, two, in May of 2014, when Flash Boys came out, there were people legitimately on Twitter and, and contacting me that thought I should go to jail, which I was like kind of startled by, right? Because I'm the CEO of a company that's engaged in a criminal enterprise, allegedly. Now, <laughs> roll, scroll forward. You know, two years later, and we announced a deal with J.P. Morgan, and they're going to be, you know, sending a lot of their risk through Virtu in the U.S. Treasury market. So you know what? You know, the pendulum swifts and the, you know, changes. Excuse me, and the world changes, and and people like you know take a deep breath and realize the world's not going to end. And at the end of the day, we're going to do what we think is right, and we're going to hold people accountable and hold ourselves accountable and perform. And if we don't perform, then people won't come. If we do perform, then people are going to come. That's really ultimately, you know, the be all end all. People don't, 
you know, aren't coming to the games because of Doug Sifu or Vinny Viola. I mean, frankly, we're completely irrelevant. They're coming because Alexander Barkov's a great player and Aaron Ekblatt was Rookie of the Year and Johnny Huberdo is going to be healthy and he's going to play well and they want to meet Luongo and Yager and Malgan and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That's really all that matters, guys. Dougie, we just want to say thank you so much for, for taking the time that you have uh, to, to be on the show and, and to uh, – uh, you know, to discuss this with a bunch of Canadians who just tweeted you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, it, it, it really has been, um, you know, it's been really interesting to hear your your side of things because owners, there's a there's a mystery around most owners. We don't get to, right. we don't get to talk to them much. So, yeah, we're we're yeah. fans of the of the Leafs in the first half of the show. Was uh, so what the hell's going on? Yeah, because <laughs> we, we know literally nothing. Right. Yeah, they're, you know they're an airtight team. So we appreciate the the fact that you've come yeah. on, you've answered every question, and and uh, and we hope that. No, you guys, are, you guys are great. And Steve, I actually watched your video when I saw it. I said, you know what, this guy's got a clue, so I'm gonna listen. So it was all, all <laughs> because you're a great video. All right. Well, thank you. You're the first to ever say that. I, I appreciate <laughs> yeah. that. Um, well, your mother, th- your mother thinks you have a clue too. Yeah, sure that's true. Okay, so there's two. She says he's handsome. There's right. two. Yeah, that's my a, yeah, yeah. my dad. I don't, I don't know. We need to make that into a shirt. Your mother thinks you have you have a clue. <laughs> Your mother, <laughs> Dougie. Thank yeah. you so much, uh, Doug Sifu. All right, fellas. Uh, minority uh, owner of both Virtue Financial and the Florida Panthers. We'll talk soon. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Take care. Take care.